Ushers, if you'll come at this time.
And this morning as we gather, we're going to look at the idea of joy. We're going to look at it through the life of John the Baptist. My wife challenged me to, to bring joy out of this story. Uh, when I told her that's what he, that was who I was preaching on this morning. Because if you really think about John the Baptist's life, it wasn't one of great joy. Some of y'all have been asked the question, we've asked these questions in the past, which prophet would you want to be like in the scriptures? Or, or, or which character in scripture would you want to be like? John was, the, according to Jesus, the greatest of the prophets. No man born a woman was greater than John the Baptist. But here's the reality of the prophets, including John the Baptist. Most were rejected by men, suffered hardship of the flesh, suffered rejection of their people and their message, died gruesome deaths. There's not a whole lot of joy in that, is there? Not if we look at it from human terms. Not if we look at it from a perspective uh, of the American dream. But if we look at it from the perspective of God, that our greatest joy comes in being faithful to the service in service to our Lord, then that puts it in a whole different perspective. Because we look at John's life, it starts with well, the, the miracle of his mom and dad uh, being beyond childbearing age, having a child. But as he grows older, he ends up living in the wilderness, camel skin, eating locusts. Now, who wants to choose John? It's the one you want to be like. Eating locusts? Come on now. That's bad breath all day long. Just a little honey. A little honey. Yeah, you've got to have a little flavor to honey. You're right. John has a message that gets him killed. He ends up being beheaded after he spends a little bit of time in prison. It doesn't sound like a joyful life, does it? But that's when we're getting our joy from the wrong place, which really isn't joy. But when we get our joy from God's Spirit being upon us, God's Spirit leading us, and us responding faithfully to God, then true joy enters our life. John had true joy because he knew why he was here. He knew who he served. He knew what God was doing. And he presented that faithfully. As we come into Christmas season, we need to be filled with the joy of God, not with the happiness of circumstances, not with the, the, the happiness of the things of this world, but rather the Spirit of God revealing truth to us and allowing us to reveal that truth to others. That's joy as we come into the Christmas season. Join me in Luke chapter 3 as we look at the life of John the Baptist as we look at bringing joy into this Christmas season. It starts in verse 4 with a prophecy being fulfilled. A prophecy from Isaiah 40. You, you heard Paul read out of Isaiah 35. There's a lot of prophecies of the coming Christ, the Messiah. One of the prophecies of the coming Messiah is simply this. A voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight His paths. And every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low. And the crooked will become straight and the rough way smooth. And everyone will see the salvation of God. John was called to fulfill this prophecy. John was called to be the forerunner of Christ. One who would be a herald of what is to come. It's really not that different than our calling today. Jesus came to die so that those who would believe in him would be saved. All who would be saved believe in Him would be saved. Not based on what you did or did not do in your past, but based on the decision you make when God reveals Himself to you. Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. To, he came not for the healthy, but for the sick. He came to reconcile all men unto Himself, all men who would receive Him. Jesus came for this purpose. John came to reveal Jesus. John came to fulfill the prophecy that says the Messiah is coming. John was faithful as God was faithful. See, God was faithful in prophesying, and God was faithful in fulfilling the prophecy. Verse 7, we begin to see the life and the ministry of John. It says, He then went to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him. I'm going to mess this up again. Brood of vipers. I pronounced it broad this morning. I almost always do. as by my poor upbringing. You can blame my parents for that. Um, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't start saying to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. 
For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What then should we do? The crowd <laughs> replied to him. And he said, The one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. And tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he told them, Don't collect any more than you've been authorized. And some soldiers came and also questioned, What should we do? And he said to them, Don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. Verse 15. Now the people waited expectantly. Uh, the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them were debating in their minds whether John might be the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand to, to be uh, in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn up with fire, with a fire that never goes out. Then along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him about Herodias, his brother's wife, and about all the evil things Herod had done, added this to everything else. He locked John up in prison. If we were to continue through the gospel story, we see that he doesn't come out of prison alive, that he's beheaded there in that prison. As we go back and look at this, the first thing we have, starting in verses 4 through 6, is the prophecy being fulfilled. Fulfilled prophecy should fill us with joy. It should excite us about the truth of God and who He is. God has promised since Genesis, since the beginning, that He would love us, that He would redeem His people, that He had a special place for us. And God's been in the, in the process of revealing Himself to us from the beginning of time. And when the time was right, he sent Jesus. Prophecy fulfilled should excite us and fill us with joy because prophecy fulfilled reminds us that the prophecy that he's given that's yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled. The prophecy in John chapter 14 where Jesus said, If I go, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and get you that you may be where I am. What a great promise of prophecy that Jesus has said that he'll take us home to heaven. All who believe upon the name of Jesus, Scripture says, will be saved. And He will prepare a place for us. And in the meantime, He's given us another promise right there in John chapter 14. He says, if I go and do all these things, when I leave, I won't leave you empty-handed, but I'll leave my comforter with you, the Holy Spirit, who will dwell in the hearts of men, who will connect us to the throne of the Father in heaven who will speak on our behalf when we don't know what to speak, who will keep us in tune with God if we will only listen. See, Jesus has not only given us a gift of eternal life in heaven, but He's given us a promise of the Holy Spirit today on earth. That should fill us with joy as we get excited about prophecy fulfilled. We should get excited about prophecy continuing to be fulfilled by Almighty God. Verse 7, as He begins to teach the crowds, He starts with, I baptize them. That's a command that Jesus gives us, isn't it? That we be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the first step of discipleship. Go make disciples of all nations. Doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We need to be about the business of obedience to Jesus Christ. And if Jesus commands us to be baptized, we ought to be baptized. In fact, John came baptizing not in the same way as Jesus. John came baptizing with a message of repentance. Repentance simply means recognizing that you're a sinner separated from God and choosing to live in a different way of life. It means a turnaround, a complete change. When we repent, we don't just confess, which is agree with God, but we commit to change our ways. When Allison deals with, with youth who, who, are, who are making decisions for Christ, she always asks them, how are you going to be different? Because if you don't make a plan to be different, you'll go back to doing the same things you did before. When we receive Jesus, we may need to make a plan to be different. We already had a, had a praise of, uh, of God's work in the life of an alcoholic. You know what the number one threat to an alcoholic is? Going back to the same friends he had before. Because those same friends he had before, if he goes back to them, he's going to do the same things they're still doing. And so 
They've got to find a new place to dwell, a safe place to dwell, a right influence in their lives. Because it's way too easy to go back to the same behavior if we go back to the same place with the same people. When we get saved, we need to be identified with God's people. How do we do that? We get baptized. We repent of our evil ways. We commit to do different and be different. And baptism is a way of being recognized among that group. Now, he went to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, and he endears them to himself with his language, doesn't he? Imagine every week if I got up here uh, and just started out with, you horrible bunch of people who are filled with sin and are worthless. Brood of vipers. It's not very nice, is it? But that's the message he preached. Very clear, very direct. What's the reality in our lives? Oh, I know we got Sunday. I don't have Sunday clothes on this morning, do I? Not Sunday morning anyway. I figured it was going to be 60 degrees. I didn't have to wear a suit today. For some of you, that's a blessing of God. For me, I take the blessing at the end of the week when we have snow flurries in the forecast. Any praise God's with me? <laughs> he wasn't endearing himself to the people. But he was giving a direct message of challenge. We need a direct message of challenge sometimes. We need to come to that place where we recognize that we're separated. When we sin, we're separated from God. What have we inherited by our behavior? For the wages of sin is? But the gift of God is? In Christ Jesus. Amen. We have to recognize this. He, John's preaching a message to get their attention. You need to be different so that you will have what it takes to, to follow God, to understand God, to be blessed by God. And he says to them, who warned you of the coming wrath? Well, of course, he's out here preaching the coming wrath. He's out here preaching this message. They're coming because they want something different. They know they need something different. They're tired of the status quo. And they want God to work an amazing work in their life. When they recognize that they're wrong, when he challenges them on who told you this, he also gives them direction. You're coming to be baptized, a repentance for your sins. Therefore, because of your heart change and life change, therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. Now, I am thankful that you're here at Calvary Baptist Church today, and I hope we'll be back next week and in weeks to come. But I want to brag on another church in our town, a church that almost all of us are going to be familiar with this morning. Park Chapel, a little over a month ago, began what has become a revival amongst their people. A message was preached that was very clear, very, very simple, uh, of a need to stop um, claiming the name of God without doing anything, without being different, and simply start living the change that's inside of us. And it took hold with their people, and as part of that, they were doing their annual missions challenge, or their, their offering challenge, much like we do Lottie Moon. And the challenge was that they build wells on a Ford mission field, not remember what country it is, um, Haiti. They build wells in Haiti. And so their challenge was $20,000 to build wells. And I think it's somewhere around $2,000 a well. So they were going to build 10 wells in Haiti. As this message was being preached, a lot of different things began to happen. Do you remember the name of the challenge that they did here locally? Bless the world. You may have heard about that. It's been all over Facebook. I've got several free meals from Park Chapel people. Praise God. That's why I'm bragging on today. You know, you go through the line and they're in front of you, you're behind you. They won't let you pay for your own meal because they want to bless you. They may not even know you. You got it? Very good. Bless the world. Well, they challenged their church to raise $20,000 and to bless the world here locally, to begin a, a, an outward approach. They took up their offering, and you know what they raised? I think last I heard was $120,000. Even for a church their size, that's huge. You know how that happens? That happens when hearts get right with the Savior. And we're less focused on our wallet and more focused on the ministry. And it wasn't just that one offering that came in, but the church has been doing the stuff around the community all over the place. To the point it's probably touched some of you. And it's touched us. Why can't we do more of that? See, what John's preaching here is what they've been experiencing. I don't know about you, but I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I want revival at Calvary. I want revival at the Kenyon Hall. I want revival in Roger. When I get excited about a changed life, and I get excited about seeing people change lives, 
I want to get back to what John says here. He says, repent. That means turn away from your evil ways. And go and do the good that you know you're supposed to do. Go and bring God glory by the way you live your life. Go and effect revival in other people's lives. As you serve them, help them to serve others. And the people begin to hear this message of John that says start with being recognized as part of our group. Be baptized. Set that as an example of repentance. You're being washed clean from your sins. You're coming out of the water, a part of this group that's going to serve God and our fathers. And he says, then go and do acts and deeds according to your repentance. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And stop saying to yourself, I'm going to get into heaven because of who I am, or who my parents are, or who my grandparents are. It doesn't work like that. Stop claiming the name of Abraham and start doing the things God's called you to do. Stop claiming a name of Christ, Christian, and start living like a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's a huge difference between the two. And we've got to get back to what John's teaching here. He says, because if Abraham needs kids and you're not willing to be them, he can make the stones produce kids. Very similar to what Jesus says when, the, when he's coming in on Palm Sunday and the, and the Pharisees say, tell your people to be quiet. And Jesus says, if I tell my people to be quiet, the stones will cry out. Stones don't have life, do they? But where did Adam come from? Y'all remember this? Back to Genesis. From the, from, from the ground, from the dirt, from the clay. What happens if you crush up a rock? Doesn't it become kind of like dirt or clay? Didn't God give life out of that? Can't God give life from that? Let's quit claiming who we are in the flesh and start claiming who our Savior is. Claim who we are in the Spirit. And let's start doing the acts of righteousness that follow our repentance. The people are looking at John saying, Amen, brother. Now what do you have us to do? Spell it out for us. Any of y'all spell it out for us, people? Yeah, we, we, we need to know, don't we? See, there's several different groups here that begin to ask John questions. They get the message of repentance. We preach that all the time. Yeah, we understand we're supposed to be saved. We hear you say we're supposed to go do stuff. Well, pastor, what are we supposed to do? The question's answered here. Now remember, we're talking about joy because if we do these things we're commanded to do, we will be filled with joy. It is almost, no, let's, let's take out almost. It's impossible to be fully obedient to Christ and not be filled with joy. If our heart is totally in tune with the Lord God, our Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, it is impossible to not be filled with the joy of the Lord. So they begin to ask questions. The crowds first. What then should we do? And John replies to them. He gives them the answer. This is real simple. If you have two shirts, share one with somebody who has none. If you have food, share with somebody who has none. Who's staying home for the Christmas season that's got open seats at your table? Nobody? Amen. <laughs> We need to be sharing, don't we? Around our tables. The, the food that's downstairs that we're taking to the Baptist Center, you all participated in that. We're going to make food baskets, and we're going to take them to those who don't have food. We're going to share. There's a lot of ways to implement this, isn't there? We're to make sure that we're taking care of one another, that we're taking care of our community, that we stand out as different. Why did uh, uh, they have so much trouble in Acts chapter 8, and we usually call it the, the, the first deacons being ordained? Or being called to service. Remember what the problem was? There were arguments that arose among the Gentile or the Greek uh, converts against the Jewish converts because their widows were being better taken care of than our widows. There was a fight in the church because we weren't doing what we were supposed to do. Because we weren't doing what we were supposed to do, a group of men had to be instituted to oversee the benevolence ministry of the church. See, we're called here in the beginning to just do what God would have us to do. When, when 5,000 people come up to Jesus and say we're hungry, actually 5,000 men plus women and children, what does Jesus do? He takes what he doesn't have from a young boy that's given to him, and he multiplies it, and he feeds them all to the point to where they had 12 baskets left over. Not a bad deal. That he who had some shared with all what he had. That's what we're supposed to do. 
So if you're part of the crowd that's following John the Baptist who's repenting of your sin and choosing to follow God, now in the New Testament we say believing in Jesus Christ, being saved by Jesus from our sins, being newborn, reborn, twice born, following Jesus now, we are to do this. First thing we've got to do is give away in the name of Jesus. That's food, but it's also clothing. If you have a cloak and you don't, and somebody else doesn't. But it's so much more than just food, isn't it? It's our time. It's our attention. It's the knowledge of Jesus Christ that we have to share. The food of life that we have to share. So to the crowd, he says, start doing the deeds that represent your, your salvation, your repentance. To the church, I would say, we've got to get busy about loving people the way Jesus loved them. Loosening our grip on our things so that we can give the eternal thing to those who need them. The next guy that comes up says is the tax collectors. The next group that came up is, is tax collectors. And they asked him, what do we have to do? So you got your, your, your crowd of well-doers, good church members saying, what do we need to do to be recognized as faithful? Well, you share with the need. <coughs> tax collectors come up and say, what do we do, need to do? And Jesus says, go to work and honor God with integrity. Do your job with integrity. Collect only what you're required to collect and no extra. He didn't tell them you can't collect taxes. So those who come to me and say, Pastor, why didn't you opt out of taxes, out of Social Security? Because Jesus never told me not to, not to give what's required of me to give. But he said, don't take more than you're supposed to to the tax collectors. Can you imagine going to a tax collector who's been ripping you off for your entire life? This guy that you despise and hate. And you go, not just with what you owe him, but with a lot of extra because you know he's going to ask for it because he asks for it every time. And you show up and you sit down before him and you say, okay, what is it today? And he says, I will only take the minimum. The rest of it's yours. What kind of witness is that going to be? It's going to be a witness that's going to say, whoa, brother, what happened to you? Don't you want the extra? How are you going to pay your bills? Why aren't you cheating me? It's a testimony for the Father and the change in His life by the Son. What would happen to us if we showed up at work with our little time card and we clocked in and we actually gave our employer eight hours of our time? And we set the example of being the best employee they have. And we didn't fiddle around on our phones playing Facebook with each other. And we didn't fiddle around, you know, that, 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 that five-minute restroom break that takes half an hour because you're reading the newspaper because you don't want to go back to work? What kind of example would it be to our bosses and co-workers if we really did the job we were hired to do? We gave them our all, and we did it as if we were doing it unto the Lord. What a difference our world would be, wouldn't it? And what if we didn't complain about the wages we were paid but simply did our job to the best of our ability every time we showed up? See, he said to the tax collectors, Go do that which you're required to do and do it with integrity. I would say to those of us who are employees, go do what you're supposed to do and do it with integrity. Do it to the best of your ability. Do it as if you were doing it for the glory of the Lord. That's what we're called to. That's what he's told here. So if you want to repent and do, do works uh, that, that, that are consistent with the fruit, uh, producing fruit consistent with our repentance, we need to do these things. So first, we've got to share with the, those who have less Second, we have to do what we do with integrity. And next, he says, um, to the soldiers who ask him, what should we do? He says, don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation, but be satisfied with your wages. That means, if you're a janitor, be the best janitor you can be. And be satisfied with your wages. And don't be jealous of the CEO. And if you're the CEO... Be the best CEO you can be. And don't be jealous of the guy in the other company. But represent God where you are. If you're the secretary, administrative assistant, be the best one you can be. If you're the manager or the boss, be the best one you can be. If you're on the line at the factory, be the best guy on the line that you can be. We need to serve with integrity in our workplaces, in our private lives, in our churches, and in our community. If we do these things, we get to be satisfied with who God's called us to be and not worry about who He's called somebody else to be, God begins to get the glory. Times have changed. The call of 
gods and they're not really any different. And I don't really think society's all that different. Don't we all want to be somebody else in some form? Well, maybe not all of us. Uh, most people, though, I think want to be like somebody else, to have that next job. We're never really satisfied with where we are. And you can say, well, that's a good thing, Pastor. I ought to be uh, trying to achieve more. But you should be trying to achieve becoming the best you you can be, not trying to achieve the best somebody else that somebody else is. we got to make sure that we're fulfilling our calling and not trying to fulfill somebody else's calling. We've got to make sure we're developing our character while allowing them to develop their character before Almighty God. He basically says, don't force people into your mold. Don't take what's not yours. Share with others those things that you have. Let's get busy about being different than those who are around us. Let's have a di different set of ethics. Let's have the Lord's integrity as we go into our communities. Verse 15. Now the people were waiting expectantly. When's the last time you were expectant about something? You know, it's Christmas season. We get expectant during Christmas season, don't you? My dog gets so... You like my puppy stories? My, my new puppy gets so excited, he expects that UPS man every day. Amazon visits us every day. And we open the box, we take the good stuff out of the box, and the puppy is so excited about getting that box. And he shreds it. And then Alice and I crawl around on our knees and pick up all these little shreds of paper every single day. There's an expectancy about that doorbell. When it rings, the dog goes nuts because he wants his package. Like a little kid, he cares more about the package than what's in the package. Right now, we're waiting on Big Day to arrive. T Tuesday afternoon, Big Day is going to arrive. Mimi is so excited. She's like that little puppy waiting to wet her pants when he walks in the door. <laughs> she is so excited about her daddy coming to visit. I can just see her tail wagging in my mind. <laughs> and it's a great thing. My parents are coming the following week. We're going to have a house full, and it's going to be a wonderful thing, and we're expectant about it. It's something we're looking forward to, something we've been looking forward to for a long time, and it's finally here. The people with John are expectant of the Messiah, and they're excited about it, and they're looking forward to it. And they're telling other people about, by the way, who in here didn't know Big Daddy was coming? Because we told everybody in the world that Big Daddy was coming. Why? Because we're excited about it. Guess who's coming? Christmas. Jesus. Actually, let me rephrase that. Guess who already came to Christmas? Jesus. Guess who's coming again to take you and me to the greatest blessing that we could not even imagine because it's greater than we could imagine? Jesus. Who have we told about it? Who have we shared this good news with? See, joy comes when we serve other people. Joy comes when we do the things of God with the heart of God. Joy comes when we get excited about the expectancy of what God has already promised to take place. This is not new. This is not a surprise. The people who are with John are expectant of the Messiah. In fact, and all of them were debating in their own minds whether John might be this Messiah. By the way, if you start acting like Jesus, people may begin to ask questions. Who is that guy? Why does he act like that? Now, you've got to be careful. Don't get a Messiah complex. Let's follow the example of John. John says, no, it's not me. I'm not worthy to untie this, the straps of his sandals. But he is coming. And we will praise him. We will worship him. We will accept him. But you start acting like Jesus, and guess what happens? You start looking like Jesus to the world. They wouldn't have asked John had he not been practicing what he was preaching. But because he lived the life, he began to look like the life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father unless he comes through the Son. He is the life. And when John started living the life, he began to look like the life. And people asked, are you him? And John said, oh, let's don't confuse things. I am but a representative. The real McCoy is yet to come. Now the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them debating their minds whether John might be the Messiah. Verse 16. And John answered all of them, I baptize with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now Jesus says that there is no greater prophet than John. No greater man has lived than, than, than John the Baptist. 
the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, the last of the prophets of, uh, of that sort in that way. But he did not know the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He did not have the privilege of experiencing what you and I have been given as a gift today. When we believe in Jesus, the scripture says that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Salvation comes through faith. Faith comes by hearing the word. God has presented that to us in scripture through the preaching and proclamation. Faith comes. Baptism comes when the Holy Spirit enters us and dwells in us. We are reborn, newborn, twice born. We are his child. We are never again the same as we once were. According to the scriptures, we are something different. John says, I baptize you with water. I, I, I do a baptism that represents the, 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 the physical cleansing from sins. But Jesus is going to come. And his baptism is different. His baptism is with the Holy Spirit and fire. Do you have a fire in your belly this morning for Jesus? You need to have. Do you have joy in your life this morning? Oh, Pastor, but this is a tough time of year for me. I don't want to be insensitive to you. I, I do get that. But if we begin to serve God more than we wallow in self-pity, please forgive me for offending those I offend when I say that. If we focus on the things of life and not on the things of death, if we focus on the things of healing and not on the things of hurt, if we focus on the things of giving and not on the things of receiving, if we focus on the things of God and not on the things of men, joy will fill our hearts. Our spirits will be changed and revival will break out in our We've got to give up the things of the world and take on the things of God. He says here, He will baptize you with this Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in His hand. He's going to clear the threshing floor. He's going to gather the wheat into His barn. Those who believe in Jesus, those who receive the gift of God, those who answer the call when the Holy Spirit knocks on your life's door and says, will you receive Jesus? Those who say yes will be gathered into His heavens. And those who say no will be burning the fires like the chaff separated from the wheat. Then along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the gospel to the people. The good news. The good news is simply this. We don't have to worry about what's on the other side of heaven if we're in Christ Jesus. We don't have to worry about hell. And I'm not afraid to say it. We don't have to worry about hell if we're in Christ Jesus. But let's don't go to heaven empty-handed. Let's take some others with us by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Let's give them something to look forward to as we fill our hearts and lives with joy, as we serve God with the fruit of repentance, <coughs> obedience to Jesus Christ, the good works and deeds that He's prepared in advance for us to do. Let's honor God with the way in which we live so that the good news will change lives. And as we begin to live according to the will of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, people will begin to say, don't you look like, don't you resemble, aren't you a little bit like Jesus? And then like John, we can say, hey, I'm doing my best, but I'm not him. Let me introduce you to him so that you can know the one who changed my life. There are always going to be those who are going to reject the truth. Herod rejected it. He didn't like the message of John. Repent and live right. In fact, he arrested John because of the message. And shortly thereafter had him beheaded. But in the midst of this, we have verse 21. When all the people were baptized, John's about the business of baptizing the Jordan River, proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the forgiveness of your sins and be baptized. In the midst of this, he baptized many people. And when they were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. Not because he needed forgiveness of sins. Not because he had to repent. Because he was perfect. Because he set the example for you and me that we should follow in obedience. We should be recognized as separated out as a holy community for God, our Father, that we are different than the rest of the world. We are a part of this group that's coming together. And when Jesus had been baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. 
in whom I am well pleased, or in whom I delight. Here's the best news of all that should fill our hearts with joy this morning. When we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the angels in heaven celebrate. And the church takes a nap. Let's stop taking a nap, church. Let's celebrate too. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the angels in heaven celebrate and the church should celebrate. We should get excited because our lives are changed, our eternity has changed. God is with us. Who can stand against us? Come on. He says, I delight in you because you are my child, you are my son, you are my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. The words of God go from Jesus to you when you become his child. In spite of ourselves, he loves us. In spite of ourselves, he has saved us. In spite of ourselves, he has prepared a place in heaven for us. And all he's asked for us in return is that we would receive him as Lord and Master and serve him. This morning, are you willing to be filled with joy that comes in knowing Jesus Christ? If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, will you receive Him today? Simply saying, I'm a sinner, separated from God by my sins. We've all been there. I've been there. Paul's been there. We've all been there. But I believe that Jesus is God's Son and He died for me. And He's promised that if I will call upon His name, I will be saved. And I receive that today as His promise. I choose to be his child. I choose to follow him from this day forward. Maybe today you need to be filled with joy in another way. Maybe through baptism. Walking when Jesus walked as we were commanded to do. If you don't walk in obedience to God, you're missing a blessing in your life. Be blessed. Follow in obedience. It only has to happen once. It only should happen once. Because God is forever. Maybe you need to come to the altars and say, Lord, I've got sin in my life and I just need you to forgive me. And I need to be restored into your presence so that I can walk with you from this day forward. I'm already saved, but Lord, I've picked up my own burdens and I need to give them back to you so that I can walk with you. Maybe you just need to come for restoration. Maybe you just need to do business with God right there where you are. We all got something we need to do before God this morning. If you want to be filled with the joy of God, you've got to have a right relationship with God. What do you need to do? For God to look down at you and say, that is my child and mine well pleased. It's simply this. Say yes. Father, we love you. And we thank you for all that you've done and for all that you're doing. We thank you for the call in our lives to follow Jesus. And this morning, Lord, we all need to answer yes to you. The question may be different for every one of us, but the answer is the same. If you're calling, we need to say yes. For those who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they need to say, yes, I receive Jesus as Lord of my life, as Master of my life. I choose to follow Him today. For those who need to be baptized, they need to say, yes, Lord, I will set that example to others that I have been washed clean of my sins and I am part of this congregation. I am part of those who refer to themselves as Christians because I love Jesus and I want people to know it. And I want people to see the example of my baptism. The answer is yes, I'll be baptized. Some need to come this morning saying, Lord, I say yes, that I understand I need to do better. That I've still sinned even though I'm saved. And I need to be forgiven of that sin. And I need to recommit this morning. I need to repent and do different as I leave. And I need to make a choice today of how I'm going to be different. And I say yes, I'll be all that you've called me to be. Lord, this morning we need to choose joy in Christ Jesus. So help us say yes. I will be filled with the joy of Christ, that joy that passes all understanding, that joy that doesn't make sense to the world, that joy that comes when I give more than I receive, that joy that comes when I serve rather than being served, that joy that comes when I recognize my place before you, Almighty God. Jesus is my Savior. Lord, speak to us. Let us respond. We ask this in Jesus' name. Will you stand with me? We're going to sing. As we sing, you have an opportunity to respond. The altars are open. You can use the front pew. You need to receive Jesus. Come and share that with us. You need to come and do business with the Lord here at the front. Come on. You just need to do business there where you are. Make sure you do the business you need to do with God as we sing out and praise our Lord this morning.
Spirit of God is present. Good. John? Beth had an addendum to the Baptist Center announcement. Thursday evening, she's going down to the Baptist Center to put Baptist together. So if you'd like to help her, see her about going down. Okay. To uh, help out putting the Baptist together. Beth and Brian are just outside the sanctuary here on the right in the uh, sound booth, and they'd be glad to meet with you about uh, putting the basket together on Thursday night. I'm going to pray for us as we dismiss. Let me just go ahead and ask you before you leave, go ahead and commend your own heart to be back tonight to celebrate with our kids. And bring somebody with you. This is going to be a fantastic, uh, I don't even want to call it a performance, gospel presentation in a unique manner. How about that? So come back and celebrate with them. Bring somebody with you so they can hear the gospel message in this unique way. I'll greet you by the front door as you go this morning. Come back next week. Remember, one service next week, 1030, Sunday school at 915. We do have evening service next week, too. So uh, one morning service and plus evening service next week. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you and we thank you for the privilege of being together today. Now, as we go our separate ways, fill us with your joy. Help us to fulfill the commitments we made in our own hearts today. Help us to live out this commitment to you publicly before this community of believers. Help us to be challenged to be all that you've called us to be. May your light shine in our lives, through our lives, and into our communities. Be glorified. Help us to be part of glorifying you. We ask this in Jesus' name, that he would be worshipped. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen.